There is a formula here that we came up with, or the book came up with, and it's the reduction of order formula. And following this along, it looks like there's some, uh, there was a typo here. The Q, after factoring out a U, would have a Y1 and not a Y1 prime. So that's a typo. I'm going to change it in my notes. Um, but I'm not going to redo these notes. So if you want to, if you had printed out the notes or if you print it out in the future, just try to remember that there's a typo here. It's, it didn't follow along. This was an actual typo. And so the logic didn't follow along with this. So at this point, since Y1 is a solution to the differential equation, this is your differential equation. And if y1 is a solution, then this is going to be a true statement. It's going to equal to zero. And so that's what happens here, that this is equal to zero. So I think that's where the typo happens, and that's where it ended. So we're still all good for the formula. The formula is still a valid formula because it was a formula that I got from the book. So that was from last time. And uh, more from last time. We found that if we had a homogeneous linear differential, second order differential equation, we assume that our solution is e to the mx. And then along the way, we come up with this thing that now we should get used to calling uh, this is a vocabulary word that we're going to a phrase that we're going to be using that this is called the characteristic equation or the auxiliary equation. And so the auxiliary equation is a quadratic. And for quadratics, we have three possibilities when the, the two roots are distinct or when the roots are, are matching. And then the last thing we did was talking about complex conjugates. And when they're complex conjugates, you get a pair of roots and that e to the i something uh, with the imaginary numbers turn out to be sines and cosines. So um, I'd like to go into that in depth a little bit more, but there's really no time in this class. Uh, maybe I'll make a recording about Euler's formula and how it's, it's this whole study of complex numbers, and it's really cool. And we had a complex number independent study uh, group one time. And so those people were able to dig deeper into complex numbers. But the um, only thing you need to know at this point is that um, the e to the some complex number is going to turn out to be some combinations of sines and cosines. And we're really just interested in coming up with a couple, two, by a couple, I mean two uh, linearly independent solutions to make up our fundamental set. And our linearly independent solutions, again, will be a pair of sines and cosines with the same um, frequency. So that's where we left off. Uh, I'd like to do some examples of more sines and cosines and, and how these things work. Uh, but before we do that, I want to also say that if we're talking about um, linear differential equations with constant coefficients, homogeneous linear differential equations with constant coefficients, uh, we're, we don't need to be restricted to just second order. We can go higher order as long as we can solve for that characteristic equation or the auxiliary equation, then we can easily find our, our solutions. Okay. So that's what we'll do. So based on this information, we'll we'll take a look at a bunch of examples, and uh, and then uh, well we should be able to wrap up this section. So let's do some examples. So I'm trying to find an example that is that might have complex 
Oh, let's pick a number between 1 and 14. 7. <laughs> All right, so let's find solutions for these things. And as long as there's no y of 0 is equal to this and y prime of 0 is equal to this, as long as there's no initial conditions, we'll, we'll assume that we're solving or trying to find the general solution. Uh, so we note that this is a second order uh, differential equation. We're going to note that it's a linear differential equation, and we're going to see that the constants, the coefficients are all constants. It's homogeneous because it's equal to zero, and so all that fits. Let's see if we can find the, the general solution. Uh, so we're going to assume that y is equal to e to the mx, and we have uh, a couple of derivatives to consider. And so we'll plug all that stuff in. And we'll see that e to the mx uh, is a factor for all these terms. We'll factor it out. And note that it's never going to equal to zero. So the only thing that's going to be equal to zero is what's left. And that is our auxiliary equation. Right? So if you do this enough times, you'll get sick of writing y is equal to e to the mx, y prime is equal to m e to the mx. And you'll just jump directly to the to the auxiliary equation, which is fine. Okay, I'm going to start doing that. <laughs> so we really just want to know when this quadratic is equal to zero. So you can mess around with trying to factor this, or you can just jump straight to the quadratic formula. Or if you want to look ahead, b squared, that's 25, minus uh, 4ac. Uh, and think about that. Is that going to be positive or negative? That's the stuff under the square root, right? So if it's positive, you'll get two square, uh, two answers. Uh, if it's equal to zero, then you'll have a repeating root, which means your second one will be just the same thing multiplied by x. And then if it's negative, then you know you'll have uh, sine and cosine. So let's just go straight into the quadratic formula. So negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. Now the c is negative, so that's going to make this positive. So that's going to guarantee that we're going to have a positive under square root. So we know we're going to have two roots, uh, 2a. So let's simplify this. 5 plus or minus, so it's 25 minus or plus. What's 48, 96? 25 minus 96 or 25 plus 96? One, 121? Square root of 121 is 11? No. <laughs> is that right? Wow, I'm doing good math now. <laughs> I play this game on my phone where I kind of brush up on my arithmetic because I'm really bad at math. <laughs> Is that right, though? OK, so it's all good. All right. <coughs> So this is 24 in the bottom, 5 plus or minus 11 over 24. So uh, 5 plus 11 is uh, 16, 16 over 24. 2 thirds. And subtract, so that's uh, negative 6 over 24. 
for you. All right. So that's it. And so your solutions, um, y1 is equal to e to the negative one fourth x. Y2 is equal to e to the two thirds x. And your y general solution, I usually like to do this in red. So it's just C1 times e to the negative one fourth x plus C2 e to the two thirds x. That's it. We're done. Are there any questions? Yeah. I did. I, it doesn't matter. You're adding order switch. So I usually like to just put the the smaller number first. But that's irrelevant. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't matter when you're writing the solution like this. When we have a non-homogeneous, it'll be important what you assign as y1 and y2 because we're going to do more stuff to it. And identifying one as y1 and one as y2 is important. But what you assign as y1 and y2 doesn't matter as long as you're going to be consistent when you move on. <clears throat> All right. So let's do another one. These things are going to end up to be quick problems, I think. Um, number 12. Let's, let's try number 12. I'm looking for one that's going to have complex roots that would have a, a, a real part in the complex number. I don't know if this is one of them, but we'll see. So uh, we have two y double prime plus two y prime plus y is equal to zero. I see all pluses there, so this has a pretty good chance of being uh, complex. Maybe. Maybe not. All right, so can we skip some steps now? Now that you guys are all experts, directly to the um, to the auxiliary equation. So we're going to go 2m squared plus 2m plus 1 is equal to 0, right? Let's skip some steps. I at least want to see this. So... How you got here is that e to the mx business, but uh, you can skip those steps, but I still want to see the auxiliary equation. So m is equal to uh, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared. So that's uh, b squared, 2 squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So that's minus 2 plus or minus the square root of m4. So that's just square root of 2, right? I. What? What? Is it? No. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm not that good at math. <laughs> I need to play more of those games. <laughs> so uh, let's see. We can simplify this a little bit. Minus 2 plus or minus uh, 2i over 4. So this is going to be 1 half negative plus or minus 1 half. So in theory of uh, complex numbers, usually when you get a complex number, we have uh, we identify an alpha and a beta. We don't need to call it alpha and beta. Generally, that's what we call it. Uh, we have uh, the real part. We call it RE of whatever that number is, and the imaginary part. Imaginary part is the part next to the I.
And um, <clears throat> the first example that we saw this last time was when the real part was equal to zero, and that turned out to be just sine and cosine. When the real part's not equal to zero, then we have to account for that in, in Euler's formula. So Euler's formula, remember, is just the, the imaginary part. And so when you have a real part, we're assuming that if this is our solution, or we're assuming that if this is our solution to the auxiliary equation, that our solution to the differential equation looks like this. <clears throat> y is equal to this with a plus and minus and stuff. And so we'll see with the plus and minus, there's going to be some linear in the linear dependence happening. And so that's when we're able to wipe out some of those pluses and minuses. Anyways, uh, as some rules for exponents, we can break this up into, remember, you're adding exponents, adding, subtracting exponents is like multiplying, dividing, whatever. Uh, and we can keep the plus and minus here, but like I said, that's going to be uh, irrelevant because we're going to deal with that later on. So the first e, the first e to the one half, negative one half x is a real part already. It's a real number already. And so uh, we're, if we were going to apply Euler's formula, we're only going to apply it to the second one. And at this point, I guess this is where we just say, just use positive. I guess this should be another color. Not that you guys can see the different colors on the screen. <laughs> And so there's this extra e to the negative one half x out here getting multiplied with Euler's formula, which is going to be a cosine of the angle. Oops, not a power. And I, although it's an imaginary number, it's still just a constant. It's a scalar. And so that can kind of merge in with a C1 and C2. <clears throat> so this is kind of like the background that's happening uh, that eventually you'll look at and just say, we'll just skip over that. And then we can just jump into the actual solution. So the fundamental solutions would be uh, each of these sine and cosine functions with the e to the negative one half x being multiplied. So our fundamental solutions, y1 is going to be e to the negative one half x times cosine one half x. And our second linearly independent fundamental solution would be e to the negative one half x sine one half x. And if you want, I'm not going to do it, but if you want, you could take one of them, take the derivative twice and put it back into the original differential equation, you'll see that you'll get zero. Or take the other one, take the derivative twice, put it back in the original equation and get zero. Or take both of them, add it together with some arbitrary constants, take the derivative twice, put that in the differential equation and get zero. So... These are the solutions, and so if we want to just wrap it all up, the general solution is going to be C1 and C2 involved. So we got um, C1 e to the negative 1 half x times the cosine of 1 half x plus C2 e to the negative one half x sine one half x. That's it, yeah. Oh, that was uh, Euler's formula. But then when we, when we distribute it and write it out, uh, the i, you can think about the i as just a constant. 
It's an imaginary number, but it's really just still another scalar, another constant. <clears throat> okay. Any questions? All right. Let's see if we can dive into um, an IVP, like maybe 29 or 30. They look like they're both going to be sine and cosines. Which one should we do? Let's do 29. You get to put zero in. You guys know sine of pi, pi over 3? Sine and cosine of pi over 3? <laughs> three, 3 over 2 and 1 half. All right, we'll do the one with a 0. <laughs> so your solutions are uh, cosine 4x and sine 4x, right? <laughs> We'll see. So it's all about being able to factor, really. That's, that's what you're doing. OK. This. Uh, auxiliary equation, m squared plus 16. Right, that's 16, not 16m. Remember, the m squared goes with the double prime, the m goes with the prime, and then the constant goes with a regular. So m is equal to plus or minus 4i. So we know that this is going to generate our sine and cosine. So we can just say y1, and there's no number plus or minus 4i, right? Then that the real part is equal to zero here. So we don't need to worry about that. <laughs> so it's just going to be sine and cosine. So cosine 4x, y2 is equal to sine 4x. OK. So our general solution y is equal to c1 cosine 4x plus c2 sine 4x. Now, we're not quite done here yet because they want us to solve the initial value problem and we have initial conditions. So we need to put the initial conditions in. Uh, we need a couple of things. We need, well, we got one of them already, y. It turns out that y of 0 is putting 0 in for x. And so we have uh, c1 times cosine of 0 plus c2 times sine of 0, which happens to be 0. Makes things a little bit nice for us. And according to the initial conditions, the y of 0 is actually equal to 2. So we got C1 is equal to 2. And then now we take the derivative, y prime, and we got 4C1 sine 4x, and I think this is a negative, uh, plus 4C2 cosine 4x, and that stays positive. So if that's your derivative, you put 0 into your derivative function. So 0 into sine, negative 4c1 times the sine of 0 is 0, plus 4c2 cosine of 0 is 1. And this is supposed to be equal to negative 2. So c2 is equal to negative 1 half. So if if you're not if you're dealing with another number that's zero, that's going to give you uh, values that that are not one and zero. Like if we would have done that other problem with the pi over three, we would have had root two over two and stuff like that. 
then you would have two equations and two unknowns to solve. And you can solve for that using Kramer's rule. You guys know Kramer's rule? Don't say no. <laughs> You're in linear algebra. And we just talked about it yesterday. Anybody in linear algebra should have said, yes, I know Kramer's rule. Do you know Kramer's rule? <laughs> you forgot it. <laughs> Who did you have for your linear algebra teacher? He must have sucked. It was me. I was his linear algebra teacher. And he doesn't remember Kramer's rule. Yeah. of the original matrix. Awesome. All right. So let's uh, let's finish this. Our, they call it particular solution. I don't know if I want to call it particular solution, but uh, they call it solution y is equal to now that we have c1 and c2 we just plug it in so c1 was equal to 2 cosine 4x and c2 is equal to negative 1 half sine 4x so if you were to take this put this into the differential equation it should work it should equal to zero and in fact if you were to put zero into this you should get two and if you were to take the derivative put zero into that you should get negative two and it all should fall into place. Okay. Any questions? All right. <clears throat> now, in the notes I had here, fundamental theorem of algebra there's like a handful of fundamental theorems in math that are supposed to be really cool but if you have a polynomial with real number coefficients a degree n then you're going to have exactly n solutions but the solutions might be complex numbers and so there's a fundamental theorem of arithmetic do you know what it is No. There's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Do you know what that is? <laughs> it actually comes in two parts. And the bottom line is that the derivatives and inverses, or the derivative and integrals are inverses of each other. They're linear, too, for linear algebra people. Anyways, um, <clears throat> the fundamental theorem of arithmetic says that you can take any whole number and factor it into a unique factor of prime numbers. What? Factor, you can factor any number, like 12. 12 is 2 times 2 times 3. All prime numbers, right? And that's the only way you can factor 12, if you factor it all the way down to prime numbers. So it turns out that polynomials can also be factored. Anyways, the fundamental theorem of algebra says that uh, the solution to, or the roots of the polynomial um, match the degree, the number of roots match the degree, if you count the repeating roots and if you count the complex conjugates. <clears throat> so... Let's, uh, let's do some examples. <clears throat> and the key is to be able to factor these things. So remember when you're in algebra class and you say, what's this good for? 
you're factoring, all kinds of factoring, the pain in the ass. What's it good for? Now you're sitting in this class thinking, damn, I wish I would have paid attention. We all know how to factor, right? So, let's do this. Uh, again, you can regenerate the characters of polynomial, and just to let you know that for higher order, the same thing's going to happen because of the, the type of solution that we're anticipating. We're saying that y is equal to m e to the mx is our solution, and you take the derivative three times, then you're going to have m cubed, right? So y prime is equal to m e to the mx y double prime is equal to m squared e to the mx, and y triple prime is going to equal to m cubed e to the mx. And so you can see that that's going to be the pattern. So our, our, our transition from your differential equation to the auxiliary equation will still be consistent for us. Now we can still factor out the e to the mx, and we just have to look at the coefficients of the of the terms in your differential equation. So uh, skipping over a step or two, we're going to get m cubed minus 1 is equal to 0. Factor this for me. Just 1, m is equal to 1. Is that the only solution? According, according to the fundamental theorem of algebra, this is a third order differential, or this is a third order or third degree polynomial. I need three solutions. <laughs> Why is it one three times? Is this equal to m minus one cubed? This is where I would take an electric shock fork and zap you. <laughs> Say no. This is what we want our students in algebra to stay away from. This is a very common mistake. It's like saying, it's like saying x squared plus, or it's like saying x plus one squared is equal to x squared plus one squared. We all know that that's not right. It's definitely not right for cubes. Oh, do this. Please do not make this mistake. Ever. Again. All right. Anybody tutoring algebra? Because <laughs> if you're not, you should. <laughs> I guess algebra two. I don't know, should it? It's a difference of two cubes. So difference of two squares, that's easy, everybody knows that. Difference of two cubes and sum of two cubes also factor, right? Why don't you guys multiply this out in your heads or on your papers? You just let me know that it's true. Is it wrong? Because maybe it's wrong, then I don't know what I'm doing. Should be minus in the middle. What? This is right? So things would cancel, right? Now you have the first and last term. All right, there we go. So um, 
m minus 1, I would call that a, a linear term. What would you call m squared plus m plus 1? There's a special name for that that you might have learned in Calc 2, although it's not a calculus term. It's algebra. What? It's a quadratic, but what kind of a quadratic? I can't factor this anymore into linear terms. So it's a uh, something quadratic. <laughs> what? Unfactorable. In Calc 2, you may have. You may have heard the phrase irreducible quadratic. It's a quadratic that you cannot reduce into linear terms. This is an irreducible quadratic. When you're learning partial fractions, I'm sure uh, x squared plus 1 would be one of those irreducible quadratics that they would throw up there. And then another example of an irreducible quadratic is this. Irreducible just means you can't factor it anymore. And if you can't factor it anymore, when you try to find the solutions using the quadratic formula, you're going to get what? What? You're going to get complex conjugates. So, you know, we got one solution, m is equal to 1. So we know e to the x is a solution for this. Now we just have to find the complex pair. So negative 1 plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 3 over 2. Negative 1 half plus or minus root 3 over 2. Is that right? Oh, hi. Was that what you're looking at, Cassie? Something else? Oh, okay. All right, so now it's complex conjugates, and now we got the sine and cosine business, but now this has a real part. So we're going to have an extra e to the negative one half x next to this. So here, e to the 1 times x is one solution. Now, out of this, you're going to get two more solutions with the sine and cosine, right? And because there's a real part, we're going to write e to that real part times x times cosine of the imaginary part. And then we're going to have the same thing on this side for the third fundamental solution. This time it's a sine. So here is, here are our three fundamental solutions. And we write the general solution. It's just a linear combination of all of them. So C1 times e to the x plus C2 times e to the negative 1 half x cosine root 3 over 2x plus C3 e to the negative 1 half x sine root 3 over 2x. Okay. Any questions?
this pretty heavy. <laughs> I don't know. You understand when people say this is heavy? Well, this is heavy, man. <laughs> what do you say now? What do you kids say nowadays? Oh, this shit sucks, man. <laughs> All right, let's try one more, since we're on a roll, some some sort of roll. Maybe it's a roll going downhill. A fourth order one? I don't know which one. 23, 24, 25, 27 is a fifth order. That's looking nasty. I don't know if I could do that one. Can you factor that? Oh, sure. We got 14 minutes. Let's do number 27. No, I really don't want to do that one. Unless you guys really want to, and then we'll yeah. all struggle to it together. Oh, we got a couple of those. All right. What else? Which one? 25. All right, <clears throat> I'm putting it down here as if we could do this with this much space. Of course, I get to skip steps now, right? <laughs> I've been skipping steps anyways. Uh, so when you guys are doing these problems, uh, you know, gauge yourself. If you think you're skipping too many steps and you're not understanding, you know, how we're coming up with the auxiliary equation and, and uh, how we're able to factor or find, use quadratic equations and stuff, um, when you guys are doing your assignments, make sure you, you go through all the steps as much as possible. Uh, even if you guys go through notes, I don't know if you guys look at notes afterwards or anything like that. Uh, try to look at the details. And there's a lot of stuff I skipped. And those places where I skip stuff, maybe you can just make notes for yourselves and say, okay, this is what happened. This is the, this is the algebra that happened between this step and this step. So think about doing that. All right, auxiliary equation to the fourth power, right? 16m to the fourth, 24m squared plus 9, just 9. So aside from the quadratic formula with anything higher, you have to find ways to try to solve for this. And uh, one way to try to solve for this, this is... This is seeming to have some sort of pattern where you have something to the all the powers are even powers so maybe there's a little trick where you can say uh, i need another variable n n is equal to m squared and so you got 16 n squared plus 24 n plus 9 and now you can just do your quadratic formula magic here um, or if you, if you could factor this, can you factor this? Is this 16 n plus 3 squared? Okay, is that right? Yeah. All right, good. So again, I skipped steps because you guys told me the answer. So when you guys are going over the notes again, how did you get from here to here? That's well, because some people blurted out the answer. But if you're not understanding it, make sure you fill in the holes. <clears throat> so what do we have here? We have um, n is equal to 
negative three over four. Wait, this is a quadratic. I'm supposed to have two solutions. What? Multiplicity two. Right? So we have something like this. Wait, this isn't even what m is. I have to take the square root of that now. m is equal to square root of n. Uh-oh, it's a negative. Plus or minus. Multiplicity two. <clears throat> wow, we got ourselves into a little pickle here. Where did that phrase come from? <laughs> you mean you got yourself into a pickle? It's a pickle. I like pickles. All right, what are we going to do now? We have a solution. Uh, we're supposed to count four solutions, right? If we were to write out all the solutions for M, four of them, M is equal to uh, positive root 3 over 2i, multiplicity 2. I should write multiplicity 2. Uh, m is equal to negative root 3 over 2i multiplicity 2. So that accounts for our four solutions. Right? Fundamental theorem of algebra says I need four solutions. There they go. These are four solutions. Now, if you have complex conjugates that has multiplicity 2, you have to you have to account for that. So it looks like we can get our solutions y1. I don't know if I'm going to do the numbering consistently or correctly here. I guess there's no right or wrong for this, but y1. Well, before we do y1, before we find the, the fundamental solution set, let's figure out what the solutions are supposed to look like. Um, e to the... Square root of two, square root of three halves, i, right? Oh, the real part is zero, right? Do we agree that the real part is zero? Well, I put an i in there, and this is eventually going to become sine and cosine. But if this has multiplicity 2, what, what happens? What do we do when we have multiplicity 2? Remember? So technically, the thing to do is to use a reduction of order formula to see if we can come up with more solutions. But uh, we know the reduction of order formula, at least for these types of differential equations, and the reduction of order formula is just going to tell us that our extra functions are going to be the x functions. Later on, we're going to take a look at another type of differential equation where the reduction order formula is going to give you a different a different factor to multiply. So anyways, from here, according to, from here, according to Euler's method, or Euler's theorem says that we're gonna have two more solutions coming out. So we got a pair of sine and cosine for the first one, we've got a pair of sine and cosine for the second one that's multiplied by an X, and so that should be our four solutions. So y1 is equal to e to the square root of 3 halves 
x. Oops, sorry. Let's go to the trig. This is what I meant to do. Uh, e to the 0. 0 is your real part. Cosine of root 3 over 2x. Y2 is going to be sine root 3 over 2. Wait, is the 2 underneath also? Oh. So root 3 over 2x. <laughs> Too many arrows now. So y3 is going to be x times cosine root 3 over 2x. And then y4 is going to be x times sine root 3 over 2x. So hopefully, when you put any of these, either of these, any of these four solutions back into the differential equation, you're going to get it to be a true statement. So our general solution then will become C1 cosine root 3 over 2x plus C2 sine root 3 over 2x plus C3 x cosine root 3 over 2x plus C4 x sine root 3 over 2 what? Because you're multiplying it by x, and then this thing becomes the sine and cosine. Is that where? That, is that you guys are uh, finding a mistake? Oh, because it's a repeated root, it has multiplicity too. For these types of problems, yeah. If if that doesn't satisfy you, then think about the reduction of order formula. We would need to use the reduction of order formula to find the, the solutions this way. Yes? Yes. And so when you change that into Euler's formula, that's what the x is. Thank you. So this is a combination of repeated roots and complex roots happening at the same time. And we just need to combine all those ideas together. <laughs> all right. Heavy stuff, man. <laughs>